Uh, all righty. Oops. No, not that. All right. Chemistry 111. Can you guys see my screen? This says titrations. I'm going to assume that you can, but I want to double check with my students. All right. Well, before we came, thanks a lot, Branson. Before we came online um, this evening in this class and before I started recording this video, uh, my students and I were having just a little discussion. I was doing most of the talking, but uh, anyhow, I said, you know, what's the purpose of a titration, right? And that's what we want to understand before we start looking at the math involved in titrations. Um, a titration is nothing more than what's described here, okay? It says, in a titration, a solution of accurately known concentration. This is usually something that you make or something you would buy. Okay, so you actually know the concentration in the number of moles per liter, and you add it gradually to a solution of what? Of unknown concentration, something that's a mystery to you. I don't know what the concentration is until the chemical reaction between the two solutions is complete. Now, when you reach what's called the equivalence point, this is the point at which the reaction is complete, and I'm going to talk about that even more. Now, how would you know the point at which the reaction is uh, complete? How would you know if you're just adding two clear and colorless solutions together? The answer is this. You would use what's called an indicator. And the indicator is a substance. You usually put it in in a very small amount, maybe one or two drops, okay? And it changes color at or very close to the equivalence point. So here's an example, and this is what I was talking about with my students before we came online. Everybody who's in this class has seen a burette because you would have seen one in the first lab, right? We actually practiced reading a burette. In the burette, you would put a solution of known concentration. Okay, let me give an example. Let's say you had some sodium hydroxide, and you actually knew the concentration of that sodium hydroxide. That's what these square brackets mean. Square brackets in chemistry mean nothing more than concentration. Concentration. So that means that you know the concentration of that sodium hydroxide in the number of moles per liter. Now, what you want to do is you want to titrate. We call this our standard. So we'll call it our standard solution. Anyhow, we'll just call it a standard. In the Erlenmeyer flask here, you have your acid. Okay. So let's say that the concentration of HCl, but you don't know what it is. Okay, you have no idea what the concentration of that HCl is. You know that concentration of HCl is measured in moles per liter, however. Okay, now just wait until I show you how the whole thing works out. So what you're going to do is you're going to add sodium hydroxide to that HCl until it reaches the equivalence point. Now what's the equivalence point again? If we are adding sodium hydroxide to HCl, that's a neutralization reaction, right? Because we're adding a base to an acid, a strong base and a strong acid, we end up with a salt plus water. So the answer is this. When all of the HCl has been neutralized by the sodium hydroxide, that's when the indicator changes color. Now, here's the important part. If you're, if you're losing me, you gotta pay really close attention here. Look at my beautiful balanced equation here. This is perfectly balanced. So we know that the stoichiometric ratio of sodium hydroxide to HCl is one to one. Now hold on, if I added sodium hydroxide from my burette and I know the volume of that sodium hydroxide and I know the concentration of that sodium hydroxide, we know that volume multiplied by the number of moles per liter, so I'll just say volume in liters, I'll make it simpler, that gives us the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, right? So we'll call it N of our sodium hydroxide. And we know that it's equi the equivalence point that these are gonna be exactly equal. So now you know the number of moles of HCl. You can measure the volume of a liquid. And now you've got the number of moles of HCl and you have the volume of it. Number of moles divided by volume in liters gives you the concentration. Give me a thumbs up if you're even like 40 to 50% of the way. If you're 100%, of course, give me a thumbs up. But even if you're like, ah, I think I kind of get it, Mr. Neil, not 100%, you know, it's kind of see what you're saying. Does anybody kind of see what I'm saying? Great. Thanks, Christian. Yeah. So 
I know that the concept of titration, I've taught chemistry long enough to know that it can be a little daunting, okay? But again, the whole point is to be able to determine the concentration of that unknown, of that acid, okay? You know that it's hydrochloric acid. You know the volume, but you need to figure out the number of moles, and that's the whole purpose of titration, is for you to know that when you're at the equivalence point, the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is going to be exactly equal to the number of moles of HCl. I'm repeating myself, right? You know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide. You know the volume from the burette. Bada boom, bada bing. There's everything laid out for you. Okay, that's the best I can do for now. Let's move on and take a look at this here. It says, titrations can be used in the analysis of an acid-base reaction. Here's another example. Besides using HCl and sodium hydroxide, we could use sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide. The important thing, my friends, is that you have a balanced equation, right? Here you have a beautiful, balanced, okay, perfectly balanced equation. Now, during the last lecture, we spoke about redox, which was oxidation reduction reactions. Um, you can use um, titrations for a redox reaction, so to determine the concentration of something in a redox reaction. We, I don't think we look at redox, unless the only time, okay, so there is a problem with the redox reaction. Hear ye, hear ye. The only time in this class that you're going to look at a redox reaction titration, because I'm sure that many of you are looking at this equation and being like, Dub, what is that? What is that balanced beast? Okay. Um, the only time I would ask you a titration problem with a redox reaction, I would give you a balanced equation. Okay, I would give you that equation because learning how to balance redox equations is something that you learn in chemistry 112. Okay, that's something in general chemistry too. Learning how to balance acid base reactions, that's something that we do in our class. Okay, this is a Chem 111 topic. Okay, balancing those equations. However, balancing these is Chem 112. So again, I can ask you a question based on a redox, but I would give you the balanced equation. Okay, so as long as you have a balanced equation, um, you should be able to answer any titration question I ask you. Okay, so these are just two examples of when we use um, titration. So for acid-base reactions and for redox reactions, those two right there. Well, let's move on and let's look at an example. And this one here, I'm going to have to kind of walk you through it because it's missing a balanced equation, but I'll help you. And once, once you have that, it gets a little simpler here. It says... Let's go through this all together as a group. It says, in a titration experiment, a student finds that 23.48 milliliters of a sodium hydroxide solution are required. Um, yeah, are required to neutralize um, 0.5468 grams of KHP. What's the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution? So here already we're finding that we've got a problem where we're going to determine the concentration of the base. Okay. Now you might be wondering, and rightfully so, what the hell is KHP? Okay. So KHP is a chemical. It's called potassium hydrogen phthalate. Okay. You don't need to know about potassium hydrogen phthalate. And again, if I was going to give you this um, problem, I'd have to give you the balanced equation. Here's the balanced equation, and that will probably clear things up a little bit. The reaction is like this. You take potassium hydrogen phthalate, which serves as an acid. You react that with sodium hydroxide. Oh, not an equilibria. Yeah, equilibria on the brain here. Anyhow, you end up with sodium. Um, um, sorry. You end up with sodium KHP. Okay. Or we'll, sell, we'll call it sodium KP because we have this hydrogen here. And then we're going to donate that to the hydroxide and we end up with water. Again, if I was to ask you this question on an exam, I would have given you this formula, or sorry, this uh, equation because you've never studied KHP. Okay. But you can see that this is a perfectly balanced equation. Okay. So. That's, this is what I would give you, and I would ask you to solve the problem in here. We have a beautiful balanced equation, and you can see that the stoichiometric ratio is one mole of KHP per one mole of sodium hydroxide gives you one mole of this plus 
water. So everything is one to one to one to one in our balanced equation. So we know that when we're at our equivalence point, the number of moles of KHP and sodium hydroxide are going to be equivalent. Now, another thing that you would need is you would need the molar mass of KHP. So I'll give you that too. The molar mass of KHP is 204.2 grams per mole. Okay, so that again is everything you would need to solve this problem. So let's start with some dimensional analysis here. We're starting it with 0 0.5468 grams of our KHP. If we want to figure out the number of moles of KHP, we have to have some kind of conversion factor that has grams of KHP in the denominator and moles of KHP in the numerator. I will use the molar mass for that, right? I know I have 204.2 grams per KHP, of KHP for every one mole of KHP. If I was to stop right here, all I would end up with is the number of moles of KHP, but we're trying to figure out the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution. Well, let's pause here for a second and let's think about the molarity of the sodium hydroxide solution. If I want to know the concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution, it's going to be equal to the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, right? divided by the volume of the sodium hydroxide in liters. Now, I don't have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide yet, but I do know the volume of the sodium hydroxide. It's given to me right here, 23.48 milliliters. Now, since there's a thousand milliliters in one liter, all I have to do is move the decimal place over one, two, three places, and I end up with 0 0.02348 liters as my volume. So what I'm looking for here is the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Now let's go back to this part over here. What's my next conversion factor going to be? Well, I need a conversion factor that has moles of KHP in my denominator and the number of moles of sodium hydroxide in my numerator. This is not a trick question. This should be on H trick questions. Could anybody tell me if, where I would get that conversion factor? Could anybody tell me where I might go to get it? Thanks, Anthony. Absolutely. Yes, Brandon. Perfect. I'm going to go over to my balanced equation. Because I know for every one mole of KHP, I have one mole of sodium hydroxide, right? It's perfectly balanced. So I put one mole of KHP and one mole of sodium hydroxide. Look at this. Moles of KHP cancel. And now I've reached my end game, so to speak. Just going to double check my math. And if you guys want to double check my math, you can turn the light on in here. So 0.5468 divided by the molar mass. And I end up with 0 0.00. Um, I should have four six figs, two, six, seven, eight moles of sodium hydroxide. There we go. So now I can pop that into my numerator over here. Let's do it. Write it in here. I've got 0 0.002678 moles and divided by 0 0.02348, and I end up with. 0 0.1140 molar sodium hydroxide. So not only did we figure out the concentration, but we've got it to four sig figs. So titration is a really accurate method for determining concentration. Notice that this reading here, the volume, right? That would have come from a burette. And as we saw in lab number one, that you can read a burette to the hundredth point. Anyhow, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that problem. We're not done. We're going to take a look at two more titration problems. All right, thanks, Warren. Good, good. Okay, well, I, now you've heard me say this Avogadro's number of times during this class, that there's a big difference between it making sense when I do it and it making sense when you do it. Um, so let's just kind of start this one together. And then I want to give you guys a couple of minutes to work on. I just want to make sure we have a correct balanced equation 
before I let you go, Max on. Um, it says, how many milliliters of a 0 0.610 molar sodium hydroxide solution are required to neutralize 20 milliliters of a 0.245 molar sulfuric acid solution? Well, the first thing we need is a balanced equation. And since we're using a strong, strong base, and a strong acid, this is going to be a neutralization reaction, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So let's write down here, we've got sulfuric acid, H2SO4, plus sodium hydroxide, and we're going to neutralize all of this acid. Okay, so if we neutralize that acid completely, we're going to need two moles of base because it's got two acidic protons, and then we're going to end up with sodium Sulfate, Na2SO4, plus two moles of water, like that, right? We have our salt plus water. Not table salt, but we have a salt plus water. So here's our balanced equation. Now that we have that balanced equation in place, let's take a look at the stoichiometry. You look at the ratio of acid to base, and you can see that it is not one to one. For every one mole of sulfuric acid, I require two moles of sodium hydroxide. So what I'd like you to do now is to start with your 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid, okay? 20 milliliters of H2SO4. And I'd like to give you, I don't know, maybe two minutes to give this a shot by yourself. It's really hard for Mr. Dion to be quiet in class. I like to talk, but especially when it's about chemistry. But I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to give this a try. So I'd like everybody to give it a shot. All right. Hey, I'm just going to throw this out there. And if nobody answers this, trust me, I'm not upset or scared. Or... Does anybody have an answer? If not, that's totally cool. Nobody has an answer. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's go for it. Um, yeah. Okay. Somebody threw up an answer. Um, We'll have to double check it. We'll have to double check it, but let's take a look here. Okay. Um, I started with 20 milliliters of sulfuric acid just because I'm going to run in a room on my screen. I'm going to change that to the number of liters. So I'll do that up here. So if I have 20 milliliters, and I know that you guys can all do this faster than I can. We have 1,000 uh, milliliters in a liter. So that gives you 0 0.0200 liters. 
So let's start with that. So we have 0 0.0200 liters of sulfuric acid. We know the concentration of, all, of our sulfuric acid is 0 0.2, 0 0.245 moles of sulfuric acid and for every one liter of sulfuric acid. Again, if I was to stop here, I would just have the number of moles of sulfuric acid. But we know that for every one mole of sulfuric acid that we have, we need to use two moles of sodium hydroxide, right? Okay. Well, if we were to stop here, okay, we would have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Now, if we have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide and we have the molarity, which again is moles per liter, all we'd have to do is take the number of moles of sodium hydroxide divided by moles per liter, and we'd end up with the number of liters. That's totally reasonable. If you want to stop here and do it that way, you can totally do it that way, and there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, you know, I'd probably do it that way some of the time. But if you just want to complete the whole thing with dimensional analysis, you could use this. You could say, okay, well, I have two moles of sodium. So at this point, I have the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, and I know that I have 0 0.610 moles of sodium hydroxide in one liter of sodium hydroxide. And look what we did now just by adding that conversion factor. We end up with the number of liters of sodium hydroxide. They're asking us for the number of milliliters. And so we'll put, oops, that's my black pen. So we'll have in one liter, we have a thousand milliliters. And so liters cancel. And we're left over with milliliters of sodium hydroxide. And when you punch that in your calculator, you end up with 16.1 milliliters of sodium hydroxide. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that one. This would be a very, very classic, you know, typical kind of question that you would see on an exam in this class. Totally normal. Um, also, if you've ever looked at an ACS study guide, this would be a very typical type of question that they would have in there. Okay. All right. Well, let's practice the exercise one more time. Uh, we got lots of time tonight, so let's practice the exercise of titration. One more time. Again, I repeat, okay? Listen to me very carefully. Mr. Dion is never, not in this class anyway, going to ask you to balance this type of an equation. Okay, this is a redox equation. And actually, balancing redox equations is not trivial, okay? There's a whole technique to it, and it would actually take, it would probably take me 45 minutes or a half an hour to explain it to you, okay? That's something that's given in Chemistry 112. However, in Chemistry 111, we would give you this equation and we would expect you to be able to solve a titration problem with the balanced equation. All right, so with all that disclaimer in mind, again, same vein, same type of problem, just a different balanced equation. It says you've got 16.42 milliliters of a 0.1327 molar um, potassium permanganate solution, and you need that to oxidize 25.00 milliliters of iron 2 sulfate in an acidic medium. What is the concentration of iron 2 sulfate um, in molarity? The net ionic equation is this. So notice this is a net ionic equation. Because if you're really astute, you're probably wondering, where's the potassium, Mr. Dion? Where's the sulfate, Mr. Dion? Where did that go? Well, those are gone, right? Because those are spectator ions. They're not even in there. So when you see MnO4 minus, that comes from the potassium permanganate. Look, KMnO4 is K plus and MnO4 minus. How did I know that? Because I memorized the permanganate ion, and obviously I know the potassium ion. So this actually represents the KMnO4. FeSO4, right, is iron 2 sulfate, Fe2 plus. How do you know it's Fe2 plus, Mr. Neal? Because I know that sulfate is 2 minus, right? So that means that this Fe2 plus here, that represents my FeSO4, my iron 2 sulfate, okay? So again, those two players are represented by these ions here. And I'm repeating myself, and if you're, where the heck did this go? Where did the sulfate go? It's a spectator ion, and the potassium is a spectator ion. Okay. So now we've got all that worked out. 
I gave myself a little more room to solve the problem here because I always end up running out of space. Let's start with what we know. You know what? Let's back up. Let's make it even simpler. We're trying to figure out the concentration of iron to sulfate. That's the whole point. Okay? That's all we're looking for. We know that it's number of moles, okay, divided by the volume in liters. Got the volume of the iron to sulfate. We know that it is one, two, three. 0 0.02500 liters. We know that. It's given to us. So all we need to do, really all we're looking for, is the number of moles of iron 2 sulfate. But look, I've got the concentration and the volume of this, and I've got a beautiful, beautiful balanced equation. So there's no reason I shouldn't be able to solve this problem. Let's start with what we know. We have 16.42 milliliters of the potassium permanganate. I'm going to convert that to liters. You just divide by a thousand, you end up with 0 0.01642 liters. Okay, just skip that step. So I have 0 0.01642 liters of my, I'll just put MnO4 minus because I'll leave it the spectator ion. And I know the concentration of my potassium permanganate. Again, I'll leave it the spectator ion. So I'll just say 0 0.1327 moles of MnO4 minus per one liter of Mn, oh, MnO4 minus. Look, if we stop here, all we'd have is the number of moles of MnO4 minus. Where am I going to go to get a conversion factor that has moles of permanganate and moles of iron 2 plus? Not a trick question. Where would I go to find a conversion factor? Somebody tell me one more time, just in case anybody's confused. Thanks, Davey. Uh, not, yeah, the net ionic equation, exactly, the balanced equation, 100%. You're both correct. And you see that the stoichiometric ratio is 5 to 1, right? For every 1 mole of permanganate, I end up using up 5 moles of iron. So look, if we stop here, look at this. Moles of permanganate cancel, and what have we got? Moles of iron 2 plus, that's all we want anyway. Because we know that the number of moles of iron 2 plus is going to be equal to the number of moles of iron sulfate. Because the spectator ions just left out. Here we go. I'm going to double check my math, and you guys can double check me too. I make all. Oh, I think it was this class that the other night I said, Am I the only person that went this thing incorrectly to a calculator? And I do it all the time. Anyhow, I have 0 0.01089 moles of Fe2 plus. If there's anybody out here who doesn't, or on here who doesn't follow me on this, look, if you have FeS iron 2 sulfate, right, and it's in solution, it's going to break apart into Fe2 plus and SO4 Q minus. I should put AQ there. So, right, that's why I can say that the number of moles of Fe2 plus is equal to the number of moles of iron sulfate. Well, let's bring, let's copy this part here. Let's see. Copy. Paste it down here. And now we can wrap up our whole problem. We've got 0 0.01089 moles of iron 2 sulfate in 0 0.02500 liters of iron 2 sulfate. And I end up with 0 0.2. Four three five eight molar FeSO four. All right, give me a thumbs up. You're like, yes, Mr. Dion, I follow you. Last problem in the slides. All right, thanks, Anthony. Fantastic. All right, now look, if you're still struggling with the concept of Titration, if you're like, you know, uh, I'm part of the way there, Mr. Dion. I understand part of it. Um, how would you master this? The best way is through practice. Okay, go into the book. Um, look at the list of practice problems that I've picked out from the book. I guarantee you I picked some that deal with titration. It's such an important topic in chemistry. Even if you're the kind of student who, and I always have one or two people in every class who like to just Google everything and look up YouTube videos by 
you know, professional, professionally produced YouTube videos, by all means, go ahead and do that. Because I guarantee you that if you go on YouTube, if you do a Google search of titration, you are going to find hundreds of videos that deal with titration. If you're, and that's, again, if you're still struggling with the topic and you're not quite sure about it, okay? Because I can guarantee you that it's going to come up on your next quiz, and I can guarantee you it's going to come up on the final exam. It's such an important topic in general chemistry. All right, well, that finishes Chapter 4. There we go. Let me go back to my teams. Ch -ch 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 -ch.